Today is April 8th, 2018. My name is Denise Cathy and I'm interviewing Maria Lopez de Leon for the Voces Oral History Project at the University of Texas at Austin. We're in Hondo, Texas, and we are here to discuss your life, the student walkouts in Hondo, uh, your work with Ellen Fomador, and your work with Nalek. Again, thank you, Ms. Lopez de Leon, for allowing us to interview you today. As we said earlier, if there's anything you don't wish to talk about, uh, we respect your wishes. If there are things you want to talk about, please let us know. We may stop the recording if you need to get a drink or use the facilities. Just let us know. Thank you. It's a and pleasure so, to be here. And so to start with this interview, um, I'd like to start by discussing your childhood. Did your family always live in Hondo, Texas? Yes. my Yes. My mom was born here and raised here. My dad was born and raised in a little community just about nine or ten miles from here. Uh, so yes, uh, and then my um, my grandparents, my great grandparents, were always from uh, this region of Texas. So this is my homeland. We have been here for generations. And your dad, T. A. Lopez, was a union organizer. Can you tell us about him? Who did he organize for? Well, he he organized for the A. F. L. C. I. O. Uh, he he uh, worked at Universal Rundle, and that was a company that made. Uh, bathtubs and sinks and whatnot for uh, Sears Roebuck and other companies and anyway it was a very low paying job and they heard he knew about unions and him and another rep another uh, one of his colleagues one of the other laborers uh, they walked and hitched rides to San Antonio uh, to go speak to union to the union to the AFL-CIO and uh, he they were successful in in um, organizing and, and unionizing Universal Rundle. And that that company was one of the higher paying jobs, you know, here in Hondo. And do you remember um, around what year this would have been? This would have been, I don't know, maybe sometime in the 1950s, I guess, you know. Late 50s, I would say. And in your opinion, what, what made him who he was? I don't know. I think sometimes, uh, um, you know, some some people are just born with the spirit, you know, uh, and I think that God spoke through him uh, and through my parents, you know, and and for both my parents and for us, we were always taught to be respectful, to honor people, and to always uh, speak up on behalf of those who could not speak for themselves and when we saw injustice that we we should step up and say something uh, and so you know as a very young man he he lost his father when he was 12 and uh, he he had uh, he was second to the youngest he was the youngest boy he had a younger sister and um, you know he really had to work hard they had to work hard as a family to be able to live you know and uh, and then when he was 16, he joined the CC Corps, um, which was part of the, the, the WPA, the federal government. And uh, he helped to build Garner State Park. And then he joined the Army at the, you know, when World War II was beginning mm -hmm. um, and served uh, very honorably. He was very, pr very proud of his military service. He earned several bronze stars for his bravery. Um, and I think this this made him uh, understand uh, more his responsibility as as a member of this nation, as a member of, of, of the military. Um, and so when he was discharged, uh, he came to Hondo, was engaged to my mom, uh, mm -hmm. and you probably heard this story before, but uh, he he took my mom and my aunt was their chaperone. He took her to the movies here at the Ray Theater in Hondo. And he sat downstairs, even though he knew that the theater was segregated, but he was wearing his uniform, his medals. Uh, they sat downstairs, and before long, the theater owner came and told him he had to move because mm -hmm. he knew the theater was segregated and blacks and Mexicans had to sit upstairs. He refused to move, um, and they brought in the, the sheriff, and um, you know he didn't want to get arrested and embarrass my mom, so he just left instead. But you know I think that was the moment uh, that he and my mom decided that they were going to work and organize to make a difference in our communities, you know, and to fight 
segregation, to fight racism, to fight injustice. And what, what was it like growing up in your family for you? It was, it was great. There was five of us, you know, we didn't have much. Uh, but, but, you know, we had a lot of love from my parents, a lot of support. My mom was really, uh, she stayed home with us, but my mom was the one that really, you know, pushed on us of how important it was to get an education. Um, and she belonged to the PTA, you know, at a time when not too many Mexican-American mothers, you know, were, were part of that. Um, but it was, it was great growing up, you know, we grew up here in, in the barrio, in, in, in Hondo. And like I said, we didn't have much, but, but it was a great time, you know, and ever since I was 12 years old, uh, my mom was busy at home raising five kids. My dad would go off to work and, you know, they were, they were uh, creating petitions with the community to have our streets paved, to have, you know, sewer mm -hmm. lines put in, to have street lights put in. So, I mean, I was 12 and 13 and my dad would leave to work and, and leave, leave instructions with my mom uh, for us to go get signatures. So we'd go knock on doors um, and, and ask people, you know, I'd tell them my dad or my mom said for you to sign this so they could pave our streets, so they can, you know, put street mm -hmm. lights here. So, I mean, it was always a, a, a time of, of working in community, you know, and, and uh, the, the cultural expressions of our community were always part of that, you know, when people gathered and uh, when I was 15 or 16, we would go to the little grocery stores in the barrio on a Saturday. We'd, my mm -hmm. dad and, and his colleagues would set up tables and we would register people to vote uh, or to pay their poll tax and, and just, you know, leafleting when there was elections. My dad ran for elections several times and other people. So we were always organizing, always organizing community. Uh, mm -hmm. And so by the time, you know, I was by the time the Rasunida party came to be, um, we, were, we were seasoned. <laughs> my family and I, my, my siblings and I were seasoned. We knew exactly what to do and, and uh, we, were, we were part of that. We were part of that. I remember I went to the, you know, and I know I'm, I'm talking beyond, you know, but I went to the, the Rasunida convention in El Paso uh, and, and, you know, it was, it was a time of, of there was a, a lot of, of segregation at the time, a lot of, of racism, you know, and, and uh, even though uh, legally schools were desegregated, you know, we didn't have mm -hmm. Spanish-speaking teachers. Uh, we were punished for speaking Spanish at home, you know, there was corporal punishment for the, for the, the males, the boys, if they spoke Spanish uh, at school. Um, and, and so that type of, that type of, of, of um, of a situation where we were meant to feel like, you know, our language was not important, our history was not important, you know, we didn't hear about our contributions uh, in school. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was, it was uh, the, the European, the Eurocentric history and language and values uh, that, were, uh, that were taught to us at the, at, the, at the schools we attended, you know. Uh, and, and so it was a, a dual, um, a dual existence, you know, we, we are very much part of this country as Mexican Americans, as Chicanos, uh, but, you know, we existed one way in our communities, there was different values, and another way, you know, that we had to, uh, that we had to be in school, another way of being, and, uh, you know, of learning and of um, speaking out sometimes, you know, and, and when I was a child, I don't know why, you know, I was, I was in second and third grade, and there was uh, other students around me that, that uh, didn't speak English. And I always felt like when the teacher was asking something and they wouldn't answer, they would, you know, put their head down and couldn't answer. I always felt compelled, and I'd get up and go to the teacher and tell her, she doesn't know how to speak English. You know, I felt compelled <laughs> to do those things and to, mm -hmm. to stand up for others, you know, who couldn't express themselves, you know, and, and, uh, and I think those are the things that many of us feel, many of us, you know, including my brothers, my sister, my parents. And I remember seeing in your form, um, your mother had done some migrant farm work mm -hmm. before yeah. the marriage to yeah. your father, um, 
In, in Hondo, was, was farm working and migrant farm working a part of the community? Not, not here. They didn't, uh, they didn't do that work here. Uh, they, they went to New Mexico, they went to Corpus Christi and uh, places where they grew cotton, where they, you know, cotton was a primary uh, crop around Corpus Christi and Sinton and all that area right now of, of uh, the Rio Grande Valley. In New Mexico, they'd go harvest other things. Um, I think a couple of times I may have gone to Arizona to harvest other crops, but it wasn't here. Um, my mom, you know, had a lot of brothers and sisters, and, uh, and, and her parents, my grandparents, you know, would do that at certain times of the year. And so she grew up during the Depression, and it was a difficult time. Uh, she tells me that sometimes they had nothing to eat except uh, they would make uh, uh, corn tortillas, with, uh, and they'd go outside and pick leaves from the pecan trees and make tea from that, and that's what they would eat. Mm -hmm. They would eat those handmade corn tortillas and, and, and pecan tea. I never tasted pecan tea, never heard of pecan tea, you know, but that's what they had to eat. And so uh, they survived. They survived. They were extremely aspirational. Uh, my grandfather then, uh, when they weren't doing farm working or migrant work anymore, he, he opened up a little grocery store in the barrio. And, uh, and my mom was the only woman in her family, the only female who knew how to drive. And she was a female who wore pants back in those times, you know, <laughs> when that was something that was, that was frowned upon. She's a female that wore pants, she smoked, she knew how to drive the Model T and the Model A, you know. So she was always very, very assertive, you know, and the whole family was very aspirational. Uh, two or three of her brothers, two of her brothers served in World War II as well. Um, mm -hmm. And, and then uh, my grandfather, once, once he didn't run the grocery store anymore, one of his sons ran the grocery store in the barrio, and then his other son also opened a grocery store on the other side of town as well. That was before, you know, um, the big corporate HEBs in here, you know, there was a community grocery stores. And I, I used to work at, at my uncle's store, and, uh, and people bought their food on credit, you know had a big ledger, and every time they'd come in, you know, I'd, I'd, uh, I'd you know, just work with them, and, and on Fridays or every two weeks when they got paid, they'd settle the account, you know, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was a different existence than it is now, you know, and I think, um, but, but one thing, one thing that I have to say that, you know, our, our, our family grew up with a lot of love, and, a lot of commitment to justice. And how, how do you feel, or, or was Honda different from the towns around it, like Natalia, Divine, and Dehanne? No, not really. You know, we, we had family in Dehanne, so we didn't, you know, and, and things were the same, you know, things were the same. Like when I, uh, when I was a freshman at Honda High School, uh, I remember clearly, uh, they put all of the Mexican-American students in, in a room, and uh, we were told, you guys are not going to college, very likely you're not going to college, so you don't need to worry about taking algebra or uh, taking geometry. You're gonna take related math. Uh, and so they put us in related math classes, you know, and so when I graduated, I wanted to attend UT Austin, but I didn't meet, I didn't have the, the math credit, so that's how come I decided to go to UT El Paso. I said, I'll go there one year, you know, get the credits and, and transfer. But, you know, once I got to UTEP, I liked UTEP, I made friends, you know, and I, I never never went to UT Austin, but I'm glad to say that my granddaughter is there now. She's a sophomore there, you know, so it's kind of like passing it forward, you know, living it. How did, how did being in that room feel like for you in that moment? Do you remember? I remember feeling very confused because I read a lot I did a lot of reading. I, I, you know, read a lot of magazines. It was during a time when I think um, there was TV shows with Marlo Thomas and others, you know, that were in New York. And I had this dream that I wanted to go to New York, you know, that I wanted to be that girl, you know, that was independent and, and uh, went to New York. So, and I wanted, I was really very interested in, 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 in going to to college, to going to the university, and so when 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 we were placed in that room and told that, I was very confused, and I just at that time, I guess I just didn't 
feel that I had the voice to say no, you know, and I didn't understand enough about college credits and what I needed to be able to say no, you know, I, I, I don't want to be here, I, I want to take algebra, you know. Um, so, you know, those are interesting things, right, of how the educational system and, and the political system um, uh, really shape people's lives, especially young people, you know, that they put you on a, on, on a trajectory um, many times uh, to not allow you to succeed. And, uh, and I was the first one in my family who, who went to the university, who attended college. And, yeah, and then many years later, I know uh, my cousin who, is, who has, a, she has a, she's a registered nurse, she has a, 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 a master's in public uh, health policy, and she told me, she said, if it hadn't been for you, she said, I never thought I could go to university or college, but when I saw you do it, that inspired me, you know. So my, my other siblings, you know, some of them went on to get their degrees, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that I was able to attend the university. And what was your first job? Do you, do you remember? Yeah, I, I worked at, at my uncle's store, uh, at the grocery store. And I was really a clerk, you know, and yeah, at the, at the grocery store. And um, what, was the, what was the name of the grocery store? Sunset Grocery. Sunset Grocery. Uh, my, one of my uncles had a store on this side of town, which is the, the east side of town. That was the, the store that my grandfather established. Mm -hmm. And so when my other uncle opened the store, you know, he opened it on the west side of the, <laughs> so that was Sunset. You know? <laughs> that was a reason for it. But anyway, Sunset Grocery was the store I worked at. And what was, what was that like for you, working in the store? Well, I mean, I used to enjoy it. It was boring. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was extremely boring. I'd have to sit there, you know, wait for people to come in and, you know, do other things with my, with my aunt and my uncle, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was interesting. You know, I was, I was, I wanted, I wanted a job and, and, uh, and, you know, I enjoyed it, although it was boring. <laughs> and at the, at the time, when you were growing up in Hondo, who, who were the Mexican-American community leaders? Do you remember? Well, I mean, yeah, my mom and my dad, and then there was uh, 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 Jesse Rodriguez. He's, he's, he was younger than my parents, but the, my parents' generation, Odilia Garcia, uh, she, she was wonderful. She was a wonderful, wonderful role model, you know, a woman who organized uh, who organized the, the Women's GI Form Auxiliary, who worked with Dr. Hector P. Garcia, who founded the GI Form. She was extremely active, you know, and my mom and other ladies were part of that. And I mean, she, she was an organizer and activist, and, and she inspired women to join the organization. And uh, so, so I greatly admired her, you know. So Lilia Garcia, there was, uh, um, I can't remember the, the gentleman's name, Mr. Dominguez. Uh, there was quite a few, quite a few people, um, who, who were active in the community, very different from what it is now. You know, the, the I remember my mom going to a lot of, of women's uh, meetings. The, the men and women rarely met together. You know, but she went, She was a Guadalupana, and people would come together. Women would come together. You know, and and. Um, and if there was problem in the schools, they went to the schools, they spoke up, you know. Uh, so, and that was like in the 1950s and early 60s. And, and so then people like um, uh, Jesus Rodriguez, who were a bit younger, you know, they started getting, my dad started engaging them as well and others. So, you know, I'm, I'm not remembering the names of, of everyone, you know, but my parents weren't alone in this organizing and, and leadership efforts. You know, there was other, other community people engaged as well. And when, um, what did you think you were going to be doing when you were a kid? Uh, were there any dreams you had about what you wanted to do? I always wanted to write. I always wanted to write, and I still want to write. <laughs> I do some writing, but... Uh, I still want to do uh, more creative, uh, more creative writing. 
and that's still that's still a, a passion that I that I still have, and I always wanted to to be a, a musician. I wanted to play the piano, uh, and um, we you know I, I knew someone who who had a piano, uh, but you know we could never afford lessons, and um, so yeah, I always wanted to be a musician, to be able to read music, and I wanted to write. Um, and, and so I made sure that when I had children that they all learn how to read music and play an instrument. You know. And what were your parents' dreams for you? I don't know. My, my mom sometimes used to say that, that she wanted me to be a teacher. And my, uh, one of my grandmothers, my, patern my paternal grandmother, would always say she wanted me to be a teacher. Um, and, you know, I think, I think they just wanted us to, to get an education and, and to, have a, to have a better life than, than mm -hmm. they did. Uh, um, and, but at the same time, they wanted us to remain um, committed to, to uh, fighting injustice in some capacity or another. They understood that we had to work. But they also uh, wanted us to continue to be engaged civically in community. And just to kind of transition a little bit, there are a few places that we know are, are landmarks here in Medina County. Um, do you remember at all Creaky Dance Hall? Yeah, of course I do. do you, what do you remember about it? <laughs> well, I remember I was in high school and they would have uh, um, dances there and events and, and, uh, and we knew that there was a sign out there that said no dogs or Mexicans allowed, you know, so I never went there. But there were some of my classmates, uh, mainly the guys, a few guys mm -hmm. who, who, um, who, who had friends that were uh, Anglo, and mm -hmm. they hung out with them, and, and they would go with them there, and they would stand outside mm -hmm. and wait for them. They knew they couldn't go in. And I don't know when that place, you know, when they took that sign down or the place became desegregated, but you know, I had my dignity and I was not about to, to go check that place out, you know, but uh, a lot of people went out there and and, uh, and we knew about it, you know, and I had, I had friends who were Anglo, but, you know, we were friends at school, we talked to each other, but we never, um, you know, socially did anything together, except if it was a school related, uh, mm -hmm. if it was school related. And how, how did you feel about the dance hall? I just felt like uh, that, you know, it, it, it I'm not angry, but I, I felt, uh, I just felt that, that uh, if that community, if, if, if the dance hall felt that way, that they weren't worth my time. And, uh, and I just, you know, it was just a part of life. And perhaps that's the reason that, you know, I, I, there was a lot of country and Western music played there, you know, and it was uh, that Anglo tradition here. And, and so I grew up really despising country Western music uh, because of that, because I associated it with, with racism, with discrimination. Um, and so it, it's, you know, I'm not a fan still of country music. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I think those kind of things shape you. I don't despise country music. In fact, my youngest daughter loves country music, and she loves to dance to it, and, and you know, and I mean, that's fine. But for me, you know, it's just, it brings back that type of, of memory. Um, and, you know, I don't hold a grudge or anything. I just don't like it. And another place in the area, um, do you remember at all the, the Azteca? Yeah, in the Natalia. Azteca. Um, did, did your family ever go there? Did you ever go there? The Azteca mm -hmm. in Natalia? No, I don't remember that. I know my dad owned the Aztec bar here in Hondo. <laughs> uh, and yeah, but I, I never went to the Azteca in Natalia. I never went there. Um, and you said there was a movie theater in town, Ray's? Ray, R-A-Y-E. R-A-Y? R-A-Y-E. Um, did, you, did you ever go there yourself? Of course, it was the only movie theater you know, in town. So mm -hmm. they used to have movies when I was growing up on the weekends, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, 
And yes, we went there as kids, we went there as teenagers, you know, and even, you know, after I graduated high school, it stayed open for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then it closed down and then it reopened again recently. And, and of course, you know, the theater is not, by the time I went to the theater, it was no longer segregated. Uh, but yeah, we went to that theater. And I think, I believe that when my parents were growing, were, you know, were young people here in Hondo, there was a second theater here in Hondo. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was mainly um, for, you know, a Mexican American theater for Spanish language movies. I believe that's a story I heard. I, you know, I never saw it, I never went there. Similar to, for example, the Alameda Theater in San Antonio, right? That the other theaters were segregated and the Alameda was ma basically a Spanish language um, theater. And I know my parents went to that theater, you know, when they were young. Mm -hmm. um, and now um, if we can just talk about um, education. Um, what was school like for your parents? Did they ever talk about it with you or? Yeah, you I mean, both of them just went to the to the fourth grade. They were in in uh, they were in classrooms with one teacher, you know, one room. Uh, my dad used to told t used to tell me that because we, they lived in a in a small ranch, you know, when his dad was still alive, um, that they had to either walk or they had you know a mule or something that they all went to you know walk together, rode to school. You know, we've all heard that story <laughs> from our parents. <laughs> Uh, or our grandparents, yeah, but uh, yeah, it was it was it was a, a time when you know both of my parents only got a fourth grade education, uh, mm -hmm. and after that, you know, they had to. I don't know. I, I I can't say why my mom or my dad, you know, stopped going to school after that. Uh, I don't know if, if there was not an opportunity, if uh, there was not another school that allowed them to to go mm -hmm. on, or if. Uh, or they just decided that it wasn't a place that they were, that they were learning enough. Not sure. And what was school like for you? Do you have any specific memories that you've kept? No, I mean, uh, I think we, we spoke both English and Spanish at home, but my mom made sure that she prepared us before we ever got to the first grade. There was no kindergarten or nursery schools. You know, my mom would sit us down and give us a pencil and paper, and she'd put the box of cereal and, and different items she'd buy at the grocery store, and she'd put them on the table, and she'd say, copy those letters and write them down. And so we learned how to write that way, and she taught us some basic, you know, basic arithmetic. And so by the time we got to school, uh, we knew how to write our names. We knew our numbers, mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah. And and my mom and dad both, you know, they they spoke English and Spanish. Um, they didn't, you know, they didn't speak English well, but well enough to, well enough to to communicate, you know. And they were able to shift back and forth between English and Spanish. And my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, who lived next door to us, uh, she didn't know how to speak English. And uh, she, if we, if we went into her house and we spoke English, she'd tell us to go outside. That if we, if we were going to be in her house, we had to speak Spanish. If we wanted to speak English, we went outside, you know. So, so, you know, we were forced to speak the Spanish. And then, you know, with my parents knowing enough English, you know, and, and we watched TV and heard radio, you know, as little mm -hmm. kids. So we knew, you know, English and, and I think in English. You know, I, I speak both Spanish and English, but if you ask me to think about something, I process and I think in English, you know. And once you entered school, were there any teachers that you feel like really advocated for students and, and for you? Well, I mean, once I entered school, uh, they, my name became Mary instead of Maria, and Luisa became Lou, so I became Mary Lou, and I graduated as Mary Lou Lopez, you know, because that's what they called me at school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I think I had a second grade teacher who was African American, Mrs. Grant, and, uh, and she really made an impression on me, you know, that, that she was a woman of color and that she was a school teacher, you know. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, elementary school was, was okay, you know, when I got to, you know, to middle school, 
it's just a little bit tougher, you know, be, not being able to speak the language, being afraid to speak to your friends or whisper something in Spanish, you know, because you'd be, you'd be punished. Um, and, and just feeling, feeling like uh, not truly belonging, I guess, you know, and the history and everything that was taught was, um, we didn't, I didn't see myself in any of that. I didn't see my family's history. I didn't see that our, our lives uh, really mattered in the, in the big picture of, of American history. How did you feel about the changing of your name? Well, I mean, I was, I was, uh, I was a little kid then, you know, but I, I remember that, you know, as a, as a middle schooler and high school, you know, I guess you, you, you feel like, like you, you get acculturated and you want to fit in, right? And it's, mm -hmm. it's what I knew since I was in the first grade, they changed my name, you know, but my grandmother, because I was Maria Luisa, my grandmother used to call me Louis, Louis. And, uh, and so, you know, you would go home and speak the Spanish and, and you know, uh, and my, my parents then started calling me Mary and Mary, you know, Mary and my sisters, you know, once in a while my older sister would call me Maria, you know, but it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was something that I guess I wanted to fit in, I wanted to belong, but then um, when I graduated from high school, I went to the courthouse and I said, I want to see my birth certificate. Uh, and so I saw it and it said Maria and it said, you know, no, actually I take, yeah, it said Maria. And so it had me as, as marked as white uh, because that's the way they, they uh, the census, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, marks Latinos, Hispanics as the white race, you know. Uh, and so I said, I don't want to be white. And she said, well, what do, what do I put down for you? I said, I don't know, put brown. <laughs> so my race is brown on my birth certificate. You know, so that once, once I graduated from high school, I felt I was compelled to, you know, go and uh, assert my name, my given name, and who I was, you know. Uh, and I, th I thought it was, you know, um, important culturally for me. And did you have a favorite teacher? Was that Miss Miss Grant? Mrs. Grant, I think I think she would have been my my favorite teacher. Uh, anyone else, you know, it was like you know, I don't I don't remember any of, of the teachers doing anything um, significant mm -hmm. for me or for some of the other students. You know, we worked hard for our grades. Uh, I remember when I was a senior, I made I made a, an A on my English final, um, and my English teacher, you know, made a comment about it, like she couldn't believe it, you know. And I remember I studied, you know, the entire weekend, and I used to love English and love literature. Um, so, yeah, you know, I don't remember any any uh, school teachers ever really going out of their way to do anything um, extraordinary for me. And do you remember, were there any Mexican-American teachers? No, not in, teacher? no, not when, not when I went to school, no. When I finished, uh, after I finished high school, I think one of the first, one of the few first Mexican-American teachers was Mr. Herrera, and he taught Spanish, uh, but I had already gone through high school, you know, I, I was taught Spanish by an Anglo-English speaker, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, the formal Spanish, <laughs> the high school Spanish that I had to take, you know, I already knew Spanish. <laughs> um, and were there any teachers you felt mistreated you or others in school? Yeah, I think there was, uh, uh, there was a, a, a teacher in high school, her name was Mrs. Bailey, and she was mean. She was very mean, and she really targeted uh, the Mexican-American students, especially the boys, you know. And uh, she would constantly report them to the office, walk them to the office so they could get paddled for whatever reason. Um, and then there was also uh, a Mrs. Grantham. She taught PE, physical education, when I was in high school. And she was also very cruel and mean, you know, to, to the Mexican-American students. Um, and then uh, <laughs> when I was... Uh, 
think I was a junior or a senior in high school. Uh, the some of us some of us Mexican American girls played hooky one afternoon. I think we were seniors. Uh, so we right after lunch we just didn't go back to class, and uh, one of the girls had a car. Anyway, they caught us. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day when we went to, to the principal's office, you know, he gave us a big lecture and he told us that all of us were going to end up in prison and all of this, you know, and so, um, yeah, so I didn't. <laughs> and we didn't. None of us did, you know. And do you have any memories from your school days that have, that have stayed with you? Yeah, I mean, I remember walking home from school and, you know, enjoying that, enjoying that, that, you know, coming home. And I remember, uh, um, I remember in, in second and third grade, you know, that uh, many of the Mexican-American students, uh, we would take lunch. Uh, my mom would pack us sandwiches uh, and some of the students took tacos, you know, to school and they would take them in a bag. And I remember that at lunchtime, you know, we would sit in the classroom and eat, and they would hide. Mm -hmm. They would hide their food, and they would have it in a paper bag, and they wouldn't bring out their food. They would put the bag up to their mouths and eat their food, you know, covered in the bag, because they were so ashamed. They would feel, you know, they were laughed at for bringing Mexican food, tacos, you know, uh, for lunch. And, I, you know, that, that stayed with me, you know, and stays with me, and, um, and just the fact that, you know, we couldn't speak Spanish, or, you know, we would be punished, you know, and always being, being on guard that, you know, the language didn't accidentally slip. Uh, so, I mean, that, that code switching was difficult as a child, you know, you'd go at home, you were loved and valued, and then you went to school, and, and yes, you were happy to be there, classmates, learning, but at the same time, you were leery, and you, had, you were afraid that uh, you would say something that would get you in trouble. And you said your your mother was involved in the, in the PTA. Were were both of your parents involved in, in school? No, my, more my mom. My mom was more involved. You know, she was a room mother, and she was involved. You know, in PTA, and whenever, you know, there was parties in the classroom, she would bake cookies, and and um, and there was a few women, few Mexican American women that were that were room mothers. You know or part of the, the PTA at that time. I think there was a PTA. I know I remember her as a, as a room mother, you know, and she would be the only, the only Mexican-American mother there in my class. And growing up, um, I know you went, you went to college, but was that sort of, was that an option that people told you was, was available to you growing up? Um, my mom and dad, you know, talked about college, but uh, not really in a way that that helped us prepare. You know what I mean? We didn't know uh, about financial aid or how to apply or, you know, how to go through the process. Um, a lot of my the the my classmates that I graduated with uh, they married immediately after high school. You know, the first wedding I was in, I graduated in May and. Two of my friends got married in June, you know, and and, mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't see a lot of my classmates going on to the university. Of course, some of them did, many of them did, you know, and, uh, but as far as the Mexican-American classmates, you know, uh, many of them did not go to university, you know, so I actually, I didn't start going to school until about a year after I graduated. I continued to work, and I worked in San Antonio, lived with my grandmother, and uh, and I decided, no, I'm going to go on to school. And what made you decide to study journalism at UT? Because I always wanted to tell stories, and I enjoyed writing. You know, I wanted to write, and I remember I had journals, and I would write. You know, and and um, and I wanted to, I wanted to tell stories. And be able, you know, to to write about those stories, and I, you know always had this dream. I, there used to be this lady there in the barrio. She was this older lady and she would take uh, children in, like orphan children or, I don't know, people would go leave children with her, you know. And, and I was always amazed at how she would, 
how she would how she could do that you know she was a woman with no education she had a little rundown house and um, she would take children in and she would take care of them and I just would always wonder you know what kind of love does that take you know to 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 I mean she had her own children but to raise children of others you know and uh, and I always wanted to write a book about her and tell her story. And I still haven't. You know? <laughs> Maybe someday I still will. I'm just kind of take a little turn here. Um, I'd like to talk about your, your political views. So how do you identify politically? Well, I mean, I, I, I vote in the Demo I vote uh, and basically, you know, I'm, I'm a Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, because I don't, you know, I'm, I'm certainly don't see, I don't identify with the values and, and the positions, uh, social and political positions of the Republican Party, um, more aligned to the Democratic Party. Um, and don't feel at this time that there's really another option for us at this point. And you were involved in another party in the 1970s? Yeah, the Razonida Party that was formed by Jose, Jose Angel uh, Gutierrez and others, his wife Luz Gutierrez, uh, Mario Compian and others. It came out of Mayo, it came out of Crystal City and the walkouts there. Um, and like I said, I went to the, to the first Razonida Party, I think the first and only national convention. Uh, I remember voting for, uh, we had to vote for uh, the chair of the party. It was either mm -hmm. gonna be Mario Compian, I'm sorry, uh, Jose Angel Gutierrez or, uh, or Corky Gonzalez from the Crusade for Justice in Denver. And Corky was more of a, of a, uh, more of a, of a revolutionary activist, you know, mm -hmm. had very different beliefs. And uh, I had already spent one year in college and learned a lot about, you know, Corky Gonzalez. And, and so uh, myself and another delegate from Texas are the only ones that voted for Corky Gonzalez. <laughs> Everyone else voted for Jose Angel as the chair, you know. And Jose Angel got the, got the, was elected chair, you know. But, mm -hmm. you know, after, after that, they ran some political candidates. I worked on, uh, I was still at UTEP, uh, and I worked on the campaign for Ramsey Muniz, who ran for, who ran for governor. Remember, you know, his wife came and organized women, and, you know, to, to, bring women together to talk about her husband's uh, uh, run for office and yeah and then you know the the unfortunately the political party fell apart after you know a certain amount of time but you know the Razonida party uh, I believe reflected what I believed in and uh, portrayed um, the history of, of our lives here and uh, of our struggle, and uh, really uh, inspired us to to uh, to resist, to resist, and to activate. And do you remember where the party lines were in Hondo? Oh yeah, I mean, there was, you know, my family and and some of the, the Mexican Americans uh, mm -hmm. in Hondo. Some, I would say, few, you know. Uh, were part of Razonida. Most of them, you know, still wanted to be part of the Democratic Party. You know, my dad didn't understand at the beginning, but then he came on, you know, and became part of the Razonida Party too. I remember uh, Jesus Rodriguez, Jesse, he was also part of that. And so uh, my dad and Jesus Rodriguez and I um, all went to the, from Hondo, all went to the, to the Razonida Convention. It was in El Paso and that was convenient because I was starting my second year at UTEP and it was in September. And so they, you know, I drove with them. My dad drove me to the campus, you know, I was gonna start school. Um, and we attended the, the, we attended the conference. Yeah, so. And your parents, I know were both politically active. What types of activities were, were they involved in as part of that? Well, I mean, they were, they were part of voter registration drives. They were part of, uh, organizing community to, to uh, you know, to fight all kinds of injustice. They, were, they would, you know, go with others. They would uh, uh, go to school board meetings, you know. They would challenge that. They would uh, go to city council meetings uh, and challenge that. They, they would run for office, you know. They would, 
go and, and speak to the sheriff, people would would get arrested and, and beaten brutally by the police, by the sheriff and the police and the city police, county sheriff, and um, and they would they would challenge them. They would challenge them. You know, why were they beating up people? Why were they arresting people? Uh, uh, why were they you know with city council? Why were they passing you know policies that that uh, really were had a negative impact on on the Mexican American community? Uh, why didn't they pay the Mexican-American workers more money, you know, just uh, uh, always, always talking about uh, uh, opportunities that were, you know, fair, that were equitable, always talking about equality. And, uh, and so, you know, either through the work of the organizations or individually or just community organizations, you know, there was, there was a time period for a long time when uh, the police would uh, beat up uh, Mexican Americans brutally, you know, for any little charge, you know, they would beat them up and people would get jailed. And I remember on Saturday and Sunday mornings, people coming to knock on my door, you know, and asking my dad for help, you know, uh, to fight this injustice or that injustice, you know. In the community, whenever there was injustice, whatever it was, either police brutality or economic or, or you know, issues of, of discrimination, they came to my parents' house. They knocked on the door and said, help us, you know. And did you ever go with your parents to the polls to watch them vote? Yeah, I did. I did. We would go with them, yeah. What was that experience like? Well, I mean, my parents would vote, uh, but my parents also uh, uh, became spokespeople or poll watchers, you know, because I saw a lot of people turned away at the polls and a lot of people were afraid to to vote, you know, and then it was also a time later, you know, uh, where we would organize and, you know, uh, really organize and, 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 uh, and uh, organize people to vote, get them registered, you know, run candidates, and then we'd go remind them to go vote, and I'd, we'd go knock on doors, and, you know, I remember women telling me, well, you know, my husband's not here, and I said, well, I'll take you. No, I have to ask him if I can go vote, you know, so women were still, a lot of the women were still, like, they had to have permission from their husbands, you know, to be, um, to be involved, to be engaged. You know, and, and that's one thing I, I, you know, going back to the Raza Unida, you know, I think that some of the disillusionment, you know, I think there was a lot of wonderful things that happened, but I think that also the role of the, wom of the woman in that party, you know, I think the women were very active. Uh, for example, Marta Cotera, you know, who's now at UT Austin, and other women, they were extremely active, but I think, uh, um, you know, the, the Rosie Castro was very active in Raza Unida, you know, but uh, I think that... Uh, Seeing, seeing the role of, of women somewhat diminished, you know, and, and we women had to, had to, you know, we had to struggle alongside the men, you know, for, for rights for our communities, but then many times we had to struggle um, with, with uh, some, it wasn't, you know, sometimes the machismo, you know, they wanted to hold us back a bit, you know, but mm -hmm. that never held me back, you know, and, and other women, you know, we, we spoke our minds and we went ahead and did what we wanted to do, you know. And were there public political rallies or events? Yeah, in town? there was a lot of, of rallies. Yeah, there was a lot of political rallies. <laughs> you know, they would organize those rallies and, and, you know, bring people together, have speakers, have food, have music. You know, so there was always a lot of rallies. Did your Did your family go to a lot of them? Yeah, well, my parents organized them <laughs> <laughs> and so with others. You know, so yeah, we would always go to the rallies. We worked the rallies. We went door to door, gave out sample ballots, you know, just everything. And, and how aware were people of, of Crystal City and other areas of activism in the community? I think they were, they were aware of it. I think there was a big divide in the, in, in the community, you know, between the Mexican American community and the Anglo community, you know. Uh, to this day, you know, if, if we do anything, you still have people in, in the Anglo part of the community who say it's those La Raza people, you know. They still call us that La Raza people, you know, that are that we're that we are nothing but um, but 
instigators and you know that we bring in outside people they just can't imagine that the people from this community could think for themselves you know or activate for themselves uh, so there's a big uh, a big division, but people knew about it, and I think because uh, because of the things they read in the newspaper and uh, mm -hmm. in in the San Antonio Light and other other community papers, you know, people were afraid of it. They felt that it was something, you know, how dare these Mexican Americans speak up and say something, you know, and 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 uh, and, and struggle for justice, you know. They they were just afraid of that, you know, and um, some of the 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 Mexican Americans that worked for for the city for the city of Hondo they worked as laborers or electricians you know um, they would report to us that you know they on the Friday before an election uh, they would tell them that if the Mexican American wins you're not gonna have a job don't you you know you're not gonna have a job when you come back so that was a form of intimidation you know that uh, you better not vote or you better you know not vote for that candidate and uh, so, I mean, it's something that continues here, you know, the, the mm -hmm. segregation and, and the racism here in Hondo is as strong as it ever was, you know. Uh, it continues to this day. Uh, we ran some candidates, uh, the, the Real Change campaign, my brother and Lucio and Gina and others, you know, we were very involved in a, in a campaign. Um, and, and as a family, you know, I didn't live here, you know, but assisted with that. and, and um, and we won. They won those positions, you know. But the the hatred, the racist hatred, and and maligning of of, of the folks uh, that won the election, you know. The, the all of a sudden there was all of these Mexican Americans on city council and Mexican Americans who didn't go along with the majority um, policies of of, of the Anglo. Uh, and so they, they made sure that they changed policies and, 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 um, and signed petitions and made false accusations and, and pushed them out of office. And that's the way the Hondo City Council still is, you know, and the county commissioners, you know, if, you're, uh, if you agree and, and don't make waves, you know, you agree with the Anglo, uh, uh, who are not the majority anymore, but those in power, um, you're fine, you you know. The the Anglo will vote for you, um, and people you know get scared. And so people have you know they say things like you know why vote? It's not going to make a difference. It's not gonna, you know it's not going to change. But you know the the demographics have shifted and they're going to continue to shift. And so uh, we just need to make sure that the next generations, you know, find their voice and get educated and know that they have every right uh, to, to, to do whatever they want to do, to run for office, you know, and, and to, to support policies and to support their communities, policies that will support their communities, policies that are fair, you know, to support desegregation. Uh, and even though the schools are, are not segregated, you know, the way students are treated, and the path that they're directed in um, is, is, you know, still has the same effect. You know, I'm glad that more, more kids, you know, the dropout rate has, has dropped here in the nation, but still high, you know, and, and happy that more Mexican Americans, more Latinos, Latinx uh, young people are going to college. Um, mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of work to be done. And what kind of representation did Mexican Americans in your area have at the, the local level, the state level? I mean, uh, sometimes there was people on the city council. My dad finally succeeded getting on the city council after many years, you know. But there were some there were some Mexican Americans on the council, maybe one uh, or two at different times, you know. But like I said, they would they were yes people. You know, they were on the council or they were on the school board, uh, and they wouldn't make waves. They wouldn't speak out on behalf of our communities or if our students were being mistreated or, you know, they were just, yes, you know, the prestige of, I guess, voting and sitting on a council and, and just going along, just going along with, with everything, you know, no matter, no matter what the police did or, you know, they, they wouldn't speak up. And so that's the kind of representation. I grew up here locally, but I knew that there was, you know, Others, other other heroes and sheroes out there 
that were running for office that were Mexican American at the state level and um, in other counties around, you know, and and, um, and I was happy for that. I was so happy for that. And it seems like like the current discussion about the political situation in Medina County is that we keep hearing that there's talk of of apathy among Mexican American mm -hmm. voters. I mean, do you do you agree with that? I agree with it. And, I and agree why do you with think that is? Well, I mean, I think you have to look at the his you have to look at it from a historical context. You know, if uh, if the community has always uh, been made to believe that uh, that voting and having a voice uh, is a form uh, and dissenting is a form of, of being unpatriotic or is wrong or is bad, you know, uh, and, you know, people running for office and, and unsuccessfully, you know, running for office, not being elected, or in the case like the Real Change campaign, people who were progressive and had great ideas, you know, uh, being, uh, uh, finding a way to to take them out of office and to malign them publicly and to libel, you know, and write libelous things in the newspapers consistently, consistently, you know. Um, and, and, you know, I guess maybe that was the beginning back then, you know, of those fake news, you know. <laughs> they would, you know, they would malign people and they would, you know, uh, they would mark you as a troublemaker, you know, and so still in this town, you know, people know I'm part of the Lopez family, you know, and, um, and my children are or grandchildren, you know, and so they still mm -hmm. look at us in that in that way of, you know, you're an agitator, you're a troublemaker, you know. Um, so, you know, but but it also, you know, it also <laughs> makes them understand that um, they need to respect us because we're not going to stay silent, you know. That we have a voice and we will speak up. And some of the people we've interviewed this project have a specific cultural identity mm -hmm. that they they prefer for example uh, Chicano Mexican American Hispanic American of Mexican descent is there a specific term that you identify with no I, I, I think I identify with all of them I'm a Chicana I'm a Latinx mm -hmm. I'm you know Latina I'm Mexican American and I think that uh, you know it's all part of, of who I am part of my identity you know and, and um, yeah I identify with all of them. And in Hondo... Except Hispanic. Oh, except Hispanic? I do not call myself Hispanic, yes, I do not. Why, why do you not? Because it is, it's uh, Hispanic, the term Hispanic is really centered around um, the, the Eurocentric Spanish uh, mm -hmm. uh, culture and tradition and origins, you know, and, uh, and I feel that it, it really does not reflect the indigenous aspects of who I am as a Mexican, as a Mexican-American, as a Chicana, as a Latina, you know. And within Hondo, were there, were there places or things you couldn't do growing up? Well, I mean, no, not, not really. I mean, there was, there was places where you felt unwelcome, you know, even mm -hmm. at the Catholic Church, you know, to this day with St. John's Church, you know. The Mexican American parishioners sit here, and the Angles sit over here. You know, and um, yeah. So I mean, there's there's places where you know things have changed some, but not not that much. You know, I mean, there are still places where you feel uncomfortable walking into. You know, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. And why not why not leave Hondo? I did leave there Hondo. Were <laughs> well, I did leave Hondo, you know, when mm -hmm. I went to school and then, you know, I came back here for a while and, and I decided after I got my my divorce that I wanted my children, it was during the 90s, you know, uh, wanted my, especially when I had a boy and I wanted them to have a different and better education in a city like San Antonio, but I was, you know, there was a, there was issues in the schools and I just felt that it was safer for them to be in a small community. So. Um, so I, and my, my son, once my son and my oldest daughter graduated, then uh, when my youngest daughter was a sophomore, then my husband got ill and we had to move to San Antonio. Yeah, so, so I did leave. I did leave Hondo, you know. Uh, 
and I, I lived in El Paso for 10 years. I went there for school, you know, and I stayed there. Um, I did leave, and, and but, but why, why should we be forced to leave, you know? This was our home. This was where generations, you know, my grandparents and my great-grandparents lived in this, in this region. And, and just the idea that, that, you know, we believe in change and we believe that it's possible and we are aspirational. Uh, and so if, if change could be made in this small community, uh, then, you know, things would be better for the community. You know, we love our community. And so why should we leave? You know, and I'd like to just transition to the walkout. Mm -hmm. It's all right. Um, what do you remember about the events leading up to the walkout on February fourteenth, nineteen seventy four? I wasn't here. Mm -hmm. I was I was in school. I was at UTEP. But but during the the during the holiday break, the Christmas break, I came down here and I extended my stay a little bit. Uh, and and um, you know, of course. I grew up knowing uh, the problems within the schools, and uh, and I know that that you know children were being who didn't speak English, you know, little kids who were in the first and second grade, you know, were being punished. Uh, they would put masking tape on their mouths and sit them in a corner for speaking Spanish, you know. Uh, boys and uh, were being you know mistreated and actually you know physically. Uh, physically uh, assaulted by teachers and coaches and you know there was just a lot of a lot of discrimination so I understood why the parents you know they had gone to the school boards they had gone to the teachers to the principals to the superintendent you know and nothing would change nothing would happen and so uh, I know why the parents decided to to you know have the walkouts have you know pull their children out of school and so I remember you know coming and, and um, helping with teaching. I know there was a lot of help from Crystal City and San Antonio and nuns. I don't remember from what uh, denomination, you know, brought books. Mm -hmm. And I remember that I, I taught a Mexican-American uh, cultural class out in the park at the T.A. Lopez Park. And I remember that there was, you know, kids gathered in front of my parents' yard, you know, just different places in the barrio where kids would, would um, would continue to be taught, you know, but we were teaching them things that they didn't hear at school, you know, mm -hmm. our history, our culture. And I remember my mother's kitchen was the cafeteria, so all the ladies would come and, you know, they would cook there and uh, serve lunch to, to, to the children, you know. And then, I, you know, I had, I had to go back to school. I had to return. And, uh, but I know that my, my brother and my, my, especially my older sister and my brother, you know, they were... They were, um, you know, in the newspapers and the media, you know, they were greatly maligned for this, you know, but then there was a lot of support from, from other places, you know, but the Mexican-American community here in Hondo was, was divided over that as well, you know. There were some kids who walked out, just, you know, they wanted to leave, um, kids in junior high whose parents, you know, didn't authorize it. They went out through windows and, you know, and just left, but then, you know, their parents were upset. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, and so, I mean, we asked for more, better treatment. We asked for more teachers, you know. So after the walkouts, you know, there was Mexican-American teachers' aides who came on, you know, and, and slowly been uh, more Mexican-American teachers uh, in the school system. Uh, but it was, it was something that that after parents and the community went through all of the official channels to try to bring uh, changes to the school system here that would be, uh, that would be helpful to, to their children, uh, mm -hmm. that would not malign their children, and um, they, this was their last resort, you know, and that's how, they, that's how they got the attention of the school district and were able to make changes. And do you remember how long the walkout lasted? Several months, I think it was a few months. That would be a question from, you know, mm -hmm. my older sister or my older brother, you know, but I think it was a few months, you know, and, and the school district, you know, was uh, was uh, extremely upset because, you know, th there was a lot of students out, you know, and when students aren't there, they don't get state money, you know, and uh, yeah. So, I mean, if you, if you talk to a lot of the Anglo population here in Honda, especially the older or my age, you know, 
they, they don't want to talk about it. And when you talk about it publicly, they get very upset, you know. And, and how did you hear that there was going to be a walkout? Pardon me? How did you hear that there was going to be a walkout? Well, I mean, I would, uh, I would either on the phone call my, my family, or I remember I would, you know, we would write letters back and forth. And, uh, and I knew they were doing, you know, the newspaper and Los Barrios, and I would encourage them, you know, and at the same time, they were doing Los Barrios there. I was doing El, um, the El Mestizo, you know, in, in El Paso, and, and just through letter writing, you know, we would communicate with each other. And do you, were, or were you aware of how people record any information about the walkout to get it out to parents? And I, uh, I, I have to say that personally I was not, but I know that Familias Unidas had a lot of meetings, parents came together, so I think those types of, of, of convenings um, was really what shaped the strategy of what they were going to do. Um, and do you remember what the reforms Familias Unidas asked for? Well, yeah, I mean, I think they asked for, for, you know, to stop corporal punishment, and I believe they also asked, you know, for more teachers, for kids, for more Spanish-speaking teachers, for kids not to be punished for speaking Spanish, uh, and um, that, you know, those are the, the major things that I, I remember, you know. And in your experience, were, were those reforms met at all? Yeah, well, like I said, you know, there was, they started hiring teachers' aides who were Mexican-Americans. Uh, I think the, you know, the corporal punishment uh, uh, for boys, you know, uh, for whatever little infraction, you know, they would, uh, they would really get punished severely, sometimes even grabbed by their shirts, or shirts would be torn off their backs, you know, and they would be hit. And so, I mean, and, and of course the punishment for the children, you know, for speaking Spanish and, you know, covering their mouths, you know, those things stopped. They had to stop and they did, you know. And of the students you, that you were teaching, do you know what their feelings were about the walkout and participating in it? Mm, I mean, they were, they were pretty much, you know, uh, agreed and they were, they were, they spoke a lot of, of what happened to them at school and how the teachers treated them, you know, and then they, um, you know, I, they, the things that I was teaching them, you know, about heroes and, and uh, culture, they had never heard, you know, and I said, that's you, you know, it matters, you know, you're, what you do and who you are also has value. And do you remember seeing um, how students were spending their time during the walkout? Well, they were, I mean, basically they, they had to sit in, a, in class, in those informal classes, and, mm -hmm. and uh, beyond that, you know, I, I don't know, you know, but they were, they would show up, and they weren't, you know, they weren't ready to go back to the classroom <laughs> any time, you know, in any immediate time. And do you remember hearing discussion among the parents about how they felt? Yeah, well, I mean, my, my parents, you know, were, were very supportive of, of, of the effort, you know, and, you know, my mom was, you know, my mom, she was, she was, she was audacious and, you know, she said, no, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to have to do, it's a struggle and we'll continue it, you know, because she just felt that, that uh, our students, our communities had been wronged. And, and how did they feel about how the school was reacting to the reform requests? They were upset, you know, because they were seeing uh, leaders in our community, members of our family being maligned, you know, and blacklisted and, you know, they, they grew up with racism, you know, even more extreme than what I grew up with, you know. My mom used to tell me, when she grew up, you know, here in Hondo, if they were walking down the sidewalk in town uh, and an Anglo person came on, they had to get off the sidewalk. And there was, you know, places they couldn't go into at all, you know, stores, they had to go in through back doors. And um, I even remember in the 1960s, I went with the, the Odilia Garcia, who, who was the head of the, of the women's GI form auxiliary, mm -hmm. um, they used to compete. We used to compete with GI form. Each chapter would have like, 
beauty queens and things like that. You remember one year I was a beauty queen and we went to San Angelo for, for the national conference and all the girls would compete. It was a form of raising money, you know, you would raise mm -hmm. money and the girl who raised the more money, you know, would, would win. And then of course those funds would go to the, to the GI Forum for scholarships or other things. Um, and I remember that we stopped in, on our way to San Angelo, we stopped in some West Texas community at a restaurant and, uh, I remember standing out there and, and uh, seeing my mom and Odilia and the other, you know, we were upset because there was a sign up in the front that said no Mexicans. So, you know, we had to find another place to eat, you know, and that was in the 1960s, you know, 68, 69. Um, and so, you know, thinking about my parents and, and their reaction, you know, they, they were used to the racism here, you know, and my mom used to tell us all the time that her father, my grandfather, used to say that, that Medina County was the most, you know, evil and racist county here in South Texas, you know. And you said that your your mother and possibly your father were part of Familia Unidas? I know my mom was. My dad, yeah, I guess to some extent, you know, uh, but my mom was very active in the meetings. And, and do you remember how the community felt about Familia Unidas after the lawsuit was dismissed? Well, I think I think a lot of people felt uh, like the like there had been a lot of division in the community, uh, or they were afraid to speak about it, you know. Um, but I think the the community felt a bit more empowered. And and do you remember sort of what the general feeling was about for uh, Aurelia Cortinas, Isabel Carrera, and Irma Torres? Well, I know, I mean, I know that, that uh, especially with my sister, you know, she couldn't get a job. She was always, you know, looked at as a agitator, as a troublemaker, you know. And I'm, like I said, I didn't live here at that time, you know, mm -hmm. so I, you know, I don't know. I can't speak to the fact that personally I went through it, you know, but when I would come, like, during a break or I would come to visit, you know, you felt from the, from the Anglo community, um, the the disdain that they had toward us because of the walkouts, because of the lawsuits, because we dared to be politically active. And let's just transition now to El, El Informador. Mm -hmm. um, how how did El Informador start? Well, I I, uh, I came home after my first year at UTEP, my freshman year. And, you know, this desire to write and to tell stories, you know, uh, uh, this was before the walkouts, you know, we knew there was a lot of police brutality, there was a lot of discrimination, and I just felt that we needed to tell a story in a, in a, in a newsletter type, you know, so mm -hmm. that summer I started at Informador. And, you know, I remember my dad and his colleagues and my mom, they were just so proud that there was a little newspaper out there, you know, telling their story. And uh, so I, I did it, I think, just for one summer. And then uh, after I, I went back to school, then the, my sisters and my brother and, and some of the students started Los Barrios. And they published that consistently for a while. And so, so what was your kind of official role for yourself with the, with the newspaper? Were you I was the editor. I editing? considered editor, founder, <laughs> you know, that was my, I wrote everything. Uh, so I was, you know, I just, I founded that, I edited it, and, uh, and then when I had to go back to school and I couldn't do it, you know, it wasn't continued, I couldn't do it from where I was, you know, and uh, then when I, when I did go back to UTEP, then I was in Mecha, I started my second year in uh, in the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicanos de Atlan. Um, and so I, I started uh, a mestizo, el mestizo there, with, with some of my uh, colleagues, you know. I came up with the idea, and then um, once I left the university, we transitioned it into a community paper, community newspaper. Um, and just this desire to, to have our voice and our stories told and to highlight, you know, the leaders in our community and the artists in the community and, and uh, the cultural practices, uh, to really be a voice of, of who we were as, as, you know, our identity, our Chicano, Mexican-American identity here. And so going back to El Informador, um, 
did it report on, on, were you just reporting on local news or were you kind of doing a wider coverage? No, just ma mainly local, but with a lot of uh, um, insight. You know, sometimes I would reference uh, things happening nationally in the Chicano community. And, and how did you assemble and get the paper distributed? We would just, you know, we, we would get a light table and, you know, we would just type mm -hmm. and type out the stories and lay it out and print it, have it printed, and, and then we put it in the grocery stores or different places where community would go. You know, we'd have copies, we'd hand it out to people if there was events and so forth. And, um, and we depend on others, you know, like the organizations, the adults at that time, the older people, you know, we'd mm -hmm. give them copies and they would also dis help us distribute them. And were you printing it yourself or was there a, a company or someone who was helping you get it printed? Yeah, we went, we went, uh, uh, to an outside source to have it printed, you know. And did um, the paper support uh, itself financially, or were there donations, or was this just kind of all of your own? It was basically on my own. There was a few donations, you know, uh, a few donations here and there for it, but, you know, it was just basically, uh, um, it was self-funded by, by, you know, wherever I could find resources. And, and how, or, or what made you really decide to, to involve other people and make sort of a little bit of a bigger project once you returned? Make the informador? Uh, no. The, the, the paper you made once you returned back to UT from the summer. Oh, El Mestizo? Yes, El Mestizo. Again, it was, it was uh, to tell our stories, you know. I think you have the very, the very first issue had a, a, a photo of a woman farm worker uh, by the artist Manuela Costa in El Paso, you know, and, and to tell our stories of the United Farm Workers and their struggle uh, to tell the stories, you know, that were happening nationally, you know, because through Mecha and all the community organizations, I mean, mm -hmm. we, we had a lot of connections with, you know, Native American communities that, that came through there, uh, leaders of, in the Native American community, other Chicanos from California, mm -hmm. from other parts of Texas, you know, we were we were in, uh, engaged, you know, in the struggles with, uh, with uh, the, in, in Denver and other places, you know, so it was a way of communicating uh, the struggles that we were facing and also to, uh, to, you know, tell those stories and inspire people and inform them um, of different movements, different, you know, Chicano and other movements, you know, across the nation. So it was, it was a lot of, of this desire, you know, to to organize and resist, resist, you know, and, and affirm our identity and our values. And, and how many publications have you you've been involved in or founded? Well, I did the Informador, and then I did El Mestizo, and then I did El Aviso, El Nalak. So there's been three. I mean, they haven't been big national successes, you know, but uh, I mean, the Aviso, you know, was, was published nationally. Uh, and, and sent out nationally, and um, but you know again, just a, a a way to express who we are as Latinos here in this nation, express our, our values, our cultural values, tell our stories that many times you know aren't told in mainstream media. And. I think that's all my questions about. The publications, unless there's anything else you feel like I haven't hit on with. No, I, I, I don't think so. I think. Okay. Um, I'd like to talk about your time on the school board. Mm -hmm. um, how how did you decide to, to run? Did, did someone approach you, or was this? Yeah, well, I mean, I was I was uh, living here in Hondo at the time. You know, it was when my kids were growing up, and I wanted them to be in this in this. I felt. Safe, for safety reasons, you know, I felt it was just better to live here. Anyway, I used to commute back and forth, I, uh, and, uh, and I knew, you know, my brother was working with the attorneys in San Antonio, you know, filing that lawsuit for single-member districts, and, you know, going to meetings and being engaged, of course, you know, we're all part of the family, and we know all of this, and, and so, you know, my brother said, why don't you run? And I said, you know, I work, I have the kids, I don't know how I'm going to do this, and we'll help you, and so, 
yeah, so I would go to work, you know, if my family provided great support, my mom, you know, feed the kids, make sure they, they were doing their homework, and while there was still daylight, you know, go out and knock on doors and mm -hmm. uh, talk to people, and, and my dad and Chewie and others, my brother, they would help me organize rallies, you know, where I would speak, or anytime there was any kind of event, a dance or whatever, you know, we would, uh, we would have uh, speakers, you know, and talk about the issues, uh, um, and and so, yeah, so I, I, I went ahead and, and, and ran um, and on a ticket that included uh, Pablo Gonzalez, who was running in another of the single member districts, and we both got elected. So for the first time, there was, uh, there was uh, three Mexican Americans on the school board. There was one person already there who had uh, served for a very long time uh, he was again, you know, these people who didn't make waves, uh, Mr. Dominguez. And I remember that he was telling people that there was no way and telling members of the school board who were fearing my candidacy, you know, that I was running and he told them, don't worry, you know, she's not going to win, she doesn't have money, you know, and I didn't, you know, but, but I organized and people believed in it. So anyway, we both won in single member districts and, um, uh, and so the other guy, you know, we were still outnumbered, and the other guy didn't vote with us on anything. He voted with the majority of the, of the, of the, the you know, the, those that held power, um, who were all white. And so, yeah, we served there for a few years, and, you know, it was, it was frustrating because, um, you know, you couldn't really impact policy, but I was, I was glad that I was there to voice opposition to a lot of things that they, they wanted to do. Uh, oh, I would say, no, that's wrong, you can't do that. I remember once they were uh, talking about dismissing this teacher. She, was, she happened to be Mexican-American and, and uh, she was unmarried and she was pregnant. Um, and they wanted to dismiss her for that, and I, and I said, you can't do that, you know, that's discrimination. I said, and would you consider firing the principal if he was engaged with someone and was having a baby out of wedlock? Well, no, we'll see. Then you can't do it to her either, you know. Mm -hmm. Things like that, you know, and then uh, t always talking to them about hiring more teachers, you know, that were, that were Mexican-Americans and hearing the superintendent say, well, we advertise, we, there's just not anybody out there. I said, that's not true, you know. A lot of people out there, you know, just trying to, to push uh, fairer and more, um, more equality and, f and fairness in the policies of the school, you know. But but when it many times when it came down to voting, you know, I mean, we were outnumbered. And and do you remember uh, what year you ran for school board? I ran for school board in maybe it was 1990, 90, 91, something like that. I should remember, and I don't. <laughs> Got to go look it up. <laughs> and and do you remember for your candidacy what what parts of the the Mexican American community supported you, and, and how they demonstrated that? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, overwhelmingly they voted for me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I imagined, you know, they they the things that I was talking about, the issues that I was raising, resonated with them, um, and. Um, yeah, and, and I talked about dropout rates, about high school graduation rates, and um, how it was important, you know, for our children to be treated fairly in the schools, and and that, um, yeah. So I think that yes, you know, the community supported me. And how how did you raise money for your candidacy? Any way we could. <laughs> You know, we would self-pay for a lot of things, but, you know, we would have barbecues, plate sales, uh, and, and we did it on a shoestring. You know, we would, uh, I didn't have money to make, you know, signs to put in the yard, so uh, we bought the paper and, and we still screened the signs. You know, my brother helped me with all that, and brother-in-law and others, you know, people helped me, and I remember we would silk screen and the kids would take the signs and put them out in the yard, and then they'd help us put them on the, on the little <laughs> on the little uh, uh, sticks or whatever they are and and, um, and we'd go put them you know go knock on people's doors and 
have an opportunity to talk to them and say, may I put a uh, sign here, you know, so, uh, and made a sample ballot, and yeah, so, I mean, it was, it was a community effort, you know, a family effort to, to raise the money and put in money, you know, whatever we could, and, and the, the, the community contributed in whatever way they could, you know, when we had plate sales or other fundraisers. So. Um, do you remember how much money you raised? Oh gosh, I couldn't tell you. I, I, I couldn't tell you. Maybe, uh, I, don't think, I don't think that it was even, I could be wrong, but I don't think it was even like a thousand dollars that we raised or maybe in that, in that area, you know, a thousand, maybe fifteen hundred, something like that. Do you remember the, the biggest and smallest donations you received? Smallest donations, I mean, I remember people giving me 50 cents and a dollar. The largest donations probably were like $20 or $25. Wow. Um, and, when, and when you guys were trying to fundraise, were there people you, you knew you couldn't or shouldn't ask in the community for Oh, money? of course, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, we knew better than to go to the, you know, 99.9% .9 of the Anglo community. There was some that did support us. And then we knew there were some people in the, in the Mexican-American community who also didn't agree with what we were doing. Mm -hmm. They just felt we were too radical and that we should just keep things, you know, uh, as they are, the and, status quo. And what, what about your candidacy made you radical? Just the idea that I was a Mexican-American woman who dared to speak up. That was considered radical to, to the, the powers that be. And so sort of going back towards uh, the fundraising, how did the money that you guys were able to raise, how, how would, did you put that to use for your campaign? Well, I mean, like I said, we would buy the ink for, for flyers. We would, you know, we had sample ballots printed, you know, just uh, that type, those types of materials. Materials or that, you know, if we were going to have a rally or something, you know, that we had a little bit of money to mm -hmm. buy a few, you know, soft drinks and refreshments and, uh, but it was all, it was all, I mean, it was, it didn't support anybody, any, it didn't line anybody's personal pockets. It was all direct, you know, supplies and materials to do the work. And, and for your campaign, were there people who were helping you full time or was it more people donating? People donating their time, you know. Uh, I think of, of anybody that was full time was more, of, you know, my brother who was, you know, uh, my brother, members of my family, you know, who were consistently there, and, and a few, you know, others like Chuy Rodriguez and others, you know, who contributed a lot of their time, you know. And so, but a lot of it was up to me, you know. If I was gonna, if I if I wanted to win that election, I knew that I needed to connect with people, you know, and. And we knew how to do grassroots organizing, and that's what we did, you know, went door to door. And, and who were some of the people who helped work on your campaign? Well, like I said, my brother, my sisters, my father, Jesus Rodriguez, Odilia Garcia. Um, you know, I know, I'm, I know I'm forgetting others, you know, the Correa family from the barrio. Uh, uh, there was the Torres family also from the Vibe. I mean, there was, there was quite a few people. A Sanchez family. And, and was there a lot of women involvement in your campaign? Was it mixed? Um, it was mixed. It was mixed, you know. I think there was probably more male than, than female, but I would say it was mixed. And how did your family view view your candidacy? As they encouraged it, they supported it, and they felt it was necessary, it was needed. And when you first started to run for school board, what, what did you expect that it, it would turn into for you? I, I think that uh, I didn't have any, any great expectations that I would be able to change the hearts and minds of, of those that didn't agree with me, of the powers that be, especially the, the Anglo community. But uh, my hope was that I could, I could have some, some impact in the lives, uh, to improve the lives of, of students, 
in the schools. Mm -hmm. and, and I really, you know, um, you know, looked at the idea of, of um, that I was a woman and that if I could help in any small way to um, encourage other women and especially a younger generation um, to understand that the, the power that they had, a power that they held, and um, I, I felt that that's, you know, that's something that was important to me. But, you know, the changing and improving the lives in some even small way of the, of the students in the and schools. I'm sorry. Um, looking back at it now, what, what did it actually turn into? Well, I think that, that the single member districts are still there, but I think that uh, other candidates that have, that have uh, I mean, there's, there's other Mexican Americans that serve now. Uh, and I think, you know, things have evolved in the schools just because it's different times, you know, but I just felt like, um, I don't know, I, I felt like maybe it set a precedent that if you were Mexican-American, you could actually sit on the school board and make a difference or try to make a difference. And how do you feel about that? Uh, to me, it's just uh, uh, a natural part of, of the way I live and who I am and, and the way we, we uh, were raised as a family that, uh, you know, it's not something that you, I'm glad I did it, uh, but it's not something that I, that I, you know, that I say, oh, you know, look at what I accomplished, look at what I did. It's just part of, of the way I live my life and the way I was taught to live my life, you know, to, to be active, to activate, to make a difference. And did the, did the walkout have any bearing on your decision to run for school board? Of course. Yeah, it did, of course. I mean, you know, I, I, I went to school here. I saw how students were treated, you know. Um, I saw um, things not changing. Uh, I, I wanted to, to have an impact at the policy level, you know, at, at the table where policy is made, um, to be able to improve the lives of, of Mexican American students. And what was your experience working with the other school board members? Um, it was it was. Uh, I think they tolerated me, <laughs> you know, uh, and and that was about it. And they were forced to listen. Mm -hmm. And and how long were you on the school board? I think like three, three and a half years, something like that. And were the people that didn't support you openly critical? The people that didn't support me? Yes. Oh yeah. Of course they were, you know. What would they say or do? Well, I mean, if I if I suggested something, they would, you know, automatically say, "No, that's not right. We can't do that. Why are you saying that?" You know, and and uh, uh, if I would criticize a teacher, you know, I, I uh, because of, of an action or something, or criticize a principal, you know, I would see teachers come to the next school board meeting in mass, you know, and. Uh, criticize and say, no, you know, you can't be saying that. He does this, she does that, you know, and, you know, but it's, it's, uh, it's not something that, um, I mean, it's not something that, that made me change my mind or made me retreat. You know, when something is not right, it's not right, you know, and, and, and I have a right to speak up about it. And were there things that you accomplished as an elected official that you're proud about? Well, I mean, I can't say that there was, uh, I think I'm just, I'm just proud about the fact that there was a, a, a Mexican-American voice say, there at the table and talking about our values and talking about uh, the Mexican-American students and, and our community. Uh, I think 
you know, that's, to me, that's what made, um, that's what mattered to me, and I think that that's what made a difference, you know, at that school board level, uh, to have them understand that um, they couldn't continue the status quo, that there was, you know, people who were going to, to, um, to really uh, activate and organize and, and call them, call them out, you know, make them accountable for what they were doing. And were, were there things that you had an idea about wanting to accomplish that just didn't happen? Well, I mean, sure. I mean, I, I wish that we had been able to uh, bring in more, uh, at that time, more uh, Mexican-American literature or Latino literature into the libraries. I was hoping that uh, that the 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 leadership positions in in student councils and in student organizations, you know, would uh, would include more Mexican American students. Uh, but you know, those are those are cultural shifts, you know, and they didn't happen. You know, I mean, I I I just I wanted to impact policy, and I thought that maybe Mexican American studies and other things, you know, could be taught in the schools, and they were later. By the time my kids, you know were in high school, you know, there was uh, Mexican-American literature or other Latino literature there that was, you know, they were teaching about Mexican-American writers, Latino writers, and, and, and studying that. Um, and, you know, the, the, that there would be changes in the way uh, history was taught. And, um, but those things, you know, they, they didn't happen while I was there, but I think that, you know, they're they're going in that direction. It's not enough of it still, you know, especially in the rural communities, you know. I know that in, in, uh, in larger cities, you know, there's a, schools uh, teach a lot more of that. Uh, but in South Texas rural communities, you know, I'm just concerned about the young people there, about the students there, you know, still facing a lot of racism, um, still are not getting uh, an equal shot at a good education in the schools, and they don't know um, um, you know, I don't think they know enough of our history as, as Mexican Americans, as Latinos in this nation, as, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, the feeling of belonging and the feeling that our stories and our culture and uh, our history also matters. And, um, and I think that uh, through art and culture, I'd like to uh, be able to get students to be more confident of who they are and why they matter and where it is they come from. I'd like to talk about your work, so like this is a great segue into your work with Malik. Mm -hmm. um, how did you first get involved in the organization? Well, I mean, the, the, I got first involved in the organization. We knew the, one of the founders, Pedro Rodriguez. My family knew him well. He, you know, uh, he'd been involved in, in a lot of other political and social issues in the state, national level. Um, and so he, be, he, was the, he was the executive director of the Guadalupe Cultural Arts Center when he and other arts leaders across the nation founded the National Association of Latino Arts and Culture. Um, and so I became involved with them uh, almost 20 years ago I was actually, you know, I was already working in, in the medical field, trying to make a living that way, you know, but still very engaged in, in community. And I was waiting for uh, a position that was opening up. It was a grant position uh, through the, the, the Health Science Center here, the University of Texas Health Science Center. And it was uh, some work that I really wanted to do, but while I was waiting, this position came up. Pedro became the first executive director of, of NALAC, and he was looking for uh, a program associate mm -hmm. um, or administrator. And so I knew him, and I, I submitted my resume, and he called me, and I said, look, I have a position, that I, some work I really want to do, mm -hmm. um, so I can... I know this is a, a, a full-time permanent position, but if you want, if you can't find anyone, I'll work with you for three months until, you know, and then I have to leave. 
uh, well, three months is now almost 20 years. <laughs> and I'm still there, you know, and, I, and the reason I was so interested is because art and culture have always been part of, 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 of who we are and part of, you know, it's not, um, it's not a, a separate part of, of our lives, you know, uh, the music, the food, the way we express ourselves, the cultural practices, you know, artists and, and culture bearers have always been part of, of our community work, a part of our community. Um, and so I, I love that work, you know, and, and, and as I stayed more with Nalak, I realized that organizing artists in the United States um, and, and advocating for resources to support the arts and cultural community here in the United States was important. And uh, so that has, uh, that, that is my passion, you know, to really organize, organize communities, because I, I believe that as you support artists and arts and cultural communities, they are the ones that are conveying the aspirations and the dreams and the realities of what's going on in our communities and giving voice to that. And um, uh, so we, we organize and we build movements at NALAC. What was the organization like when you first joined? It was, it was uh, two people. Pedro was a, a part-time first executive director. I'm you know, and I became the second executive director and now am, you know, have the position of president and CEO, but I'm, I'm the second person to hold the leadership of NALAC. And uh, the organization was two people, um, small office. Uh, our budget was about uh, probably $300,000. Um, and our budget now is about $1.92 million. Um, and so, you know, we have much more staff. <laughs> We have nine people working in the office. We have, you know, four people working virtually. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we, you know, we have made an impact on the nation. And then several years ago, and, I'm, and we have a wonderful national board of other Latino arts leaders, you know, people who lead their own organizations or have founded their organizations, artists, educators. And, and the Latino arts community is, is uh, very diverse representing many Latinidades, you know, it's not just Mexican-American, uh, many Latinidades, and we have, uh, it's very intergenerational, interdisciplinary, mm -hmm. you know, we support all disciplines, support artists and organizations. And when you, so when you first kind of signed on to the organization, what, what were your expectations for how that was going to go for you and, and your hopes? Um, I, I, you know, I, I wasn't sure. I, I think I, when I became the second executive director, you know, I, I understood that I didn't have the arts administrative skills that my predecessor had, but I had worked with him for many years and, you know, he, he, for several years, for about two years and, and learned a lot from him. And I think that, uh, my board of directors was very supportive and, um, and, and, you know, I had this idea that, that we could organize artists, that there could be a national Latino arts movement, um, and that we could connect people and network people, and we have. Our, our network is broad. Now it includes Mexico, Central America, Cuba, Puerto Rico, of course. And now that you're, you're looking at this from being there definitely longer than three months, what, what did this become? become for for you um, you know it's it's about uh, uh, it's about leadership building it's about uh, next generation it has become about next generation you know how do we how do we think about future forward about arts and culture and, and our communities you know and understanding that um, especially in these times you know we have a lot of, of, of DACA and dreamers that are artists, that are part of our community, that are grantees of ours, you know, we support their work and understand the importance uh, of arts and culture in, in, in shifting the narrative and the paradigm uh, of this nation. And the paradigm of how arts are supported, of how culture is is uh, is uh, expressed. You know, I see a big 
um, we need to desegregate culture here in the United States. You know, it is the, the mainstream institutions, the museums, the ballets, the, the orchestras, uh, who are supported uh, with resources and opportunities, and it is the Mexican-American organizations of color, communities of, or, uh, of color, that are not supported equitably, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to change that paradigm, paradigm. We need to change that narrative, and we are, you know. We're doing new programs. We work interculturally with Native American groups, African American groups, Asian. And uh, last year we founded, we co-founded um, the Intercultural Leadership Institute. So we're developing leadership in the arts and community um, at different levels. We have the Nalek Leadership Institute that this year will be 18 years old. We've got almost 400 mm -hmm. alumni across the country, artists, arts administrators. They're the future, they're on the ground. No matter where I go, if I go to Austin or New York or LA or you know, there's, there's Nalakeros there who are saying, you know, young, their next generation, working very intergenerationally and moving um, culture forward, Latino culture, the, the issues of their Latino communities. Uh, and we have an advocacy institute in Washington, D.C. We take people there, they learn how to advocate at local and national, you know, levels. We have the Intercultural Institute bringing together different from, people from different, uh, races and cultures, you know, to learn uh, about our, our, our histories, our cultural practices, uh, the different values, and how we can work together to really shift the paradigm um, for a more equitable society. And why did you decide to take on the executive director position and then become president? Uh, I wanted the work to continue. And I didn't, I didn't really, you know, we, the NALEC was, uh, was engaged in a national search for the next executive director. I did not apply for it. You know, I was glad to be there and glad to be doing what I was doing. I was doing a, a, the Iboletin, which is now virtual, you know, but it was at that time it was a, a, we mailed it out, you know, and we did the Avis. I was happy with what I was doing, trying to build the membership. Uh, and the board approached me about it. And, uh, and the personnel committee of the board, and I said, whoa, wait a minute, you know, I can't, I don't know what Pedro knows, you know. He said, no, but you, you know how to organize him, you know how to work community. So I said, I'll do it with your support, you know, and, and they have been very supportive, you know, as board members, you know, past and present, extremely supportive. I couldn't do this work without them, you know. They were leaders, uh, national leaders, you know, local leaders, and, and, um, um, I think we, you know, we've learned, we've evolved as an organization, you know. I've certainly learned a lot from artists, from communities, from. And what are some of your proudest moments from your work with Malik? I think that, that um, seeing our Leadership Institute thrive and helping to create uh, next generation leadership, I think that's that's something that I, I'm very proud of. And the fact that as we, you know, through the years, you know, listening to artists and organizations talking about the lack of resources to do our work, you know, and, and we established, uh, I'm very proud of the fact that the NALAC Fund for the Arts um, uh, has been able to award over $2.5 million to Latino artists and organizations across the country in Puerto Rico that we do have uh, transnational work that, you know, supports uh, Mexico and Central America for exchanges, uh, that we, I wish we had more money, of course, you know, of course I wish we had more money to award, you know, but uh, it's the only uh, grant program in the nation that exclusively supports la the Latino arts. You know, and, and in the future, I hope that there will be many more um, and and I think that being an advocate and being able being able to raise the visibility and the appreciation of Latino arts in this country at a national level, you know, along with others, I think that's yeah, that's something that I'm very proud of. You know, my advocacy efforts and and that that because you know because of our advocacy efforts, you know, that that it led. Uh, President Obama to appoint me as a member uh, of the National Council on the Arts, a council I still sit on. 
um, and that council oversees the National Endowment for the Arts, which is the only you know federal program that mm -hmm. uh, a federal agency that supports uh, arts and culture here in the in the United States, and to be able to uh, make a difference at the at the policy level. Um, and of course, it was you know. Uh, much easier in the previous administration than in the current administration, you know. But, but just you know, ha being able to 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 raise again the visibility and the appreciation of Latino, Latinx, arts and culture expression here in the U in the United States, and being able to advocate um, for resources and opportunities. To build, help, help uh, not to build, but to to bring people together. Because you know, artists and, and arts administration, arts administrators who go through our leadership programs uh, are already you know accomplished and, and uh, they're creating beautiful, wonderful work. You know, but to be able to network them, and um, and bring that that those numbers and that power together, you know, as, as new leadership, next generation leadership for the, for our community. And, and how did it feel to get that appointment to the National Council on the Arts for you? I was surprised. I was, <laughs> I thought it was, I thought it was a joke, you know, I, I, we were actually, I was actually, we were having, NALAC was having its Advocacy Leadership Institute in Washington, D.C., and uh, I, I, saw a message on my phone, I listened to it, and it was a guy who said he was an attorney from the White House, and he wanted to talk to me, and he gave me his name, and I, I ran over to my colleague, my board member and friend, Rosalba's, you know, we were there, and I said, look, do you think this is, this is, this must be a joke, and we Googled his name, and we found out that, yes, in fact, it was working in the Obama White House. So anyway, I called him back, and, and I was just surprised, and I said, you know, are you sure, you know, this is, me you want you know and they said yes you know so because you know for many for many years you know NALAC has always uh, been doing our, our work you know with with uh, the National Endowment for the Arts you know really talking about and advocating for more support for Latino organizations in our communities you know and so I've been I've been very vociferous about that I was always was you know and so I was surprised um, when I was asked to sit on the council you know that that advise the chair of the NEA and help to, to make policy and improve grants and all this. So um, it was a long process and, and I thought, you know, we, I have to be approved by the Senate um, and so, you know, you have to divulge so many things and at one point I told my husband, you know, we really, we don't have to do this, you know, he said, no, do it, you know, because you had to, I had to talk about every organization I had ever been a part of. Uh, since I was 18 years old, you know, I had to divulge all that. And I thought, forget it, you know, I've been an activist all my life. I've been at the front lines, you know, supporting, you know, picket lines and, you know, farm workers, everything. And, and no, I was, you know, my approval passed and, and uh, I was just surprised. Uh, but but I, was, I was happy because right now the, the National Council on the Arts is the most diverse it has ever been. And I was happy that uh, the president, his administration, understood the power of the arts and, and the need to, to uh, have diverse voices on that council. And are there, are there things that you haven't been able to accomplish yet or, or that you're still working on for NALAC? Well, I mean, it, yeah, it's, a, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's an on, it's an ongoing, you know, it's an ongoing, uh, uh, effort to be able to to advocate and bring more resources to to the latin arts community uh, but i also think about uh, other work that i want to do with young people in south texas and uh, to bring arts and culture to rural communities like hondo and others you know uh, to create a network of young people who who understand who they are and who are proud of, of their culture and their their heritage. And so you were one of the advisors for the movie Coco. Mm -hmm. How how did that happen? 
Well, I mean, the fact that, that I, I serve in that leadership capacity of a national organization and uh, here was Disney, you know, making, wanting to make a, a, a movie and, and I think they had had other, they had tried to make another movie uh, about Day of the Dead. It was, a, you know, a big disaster and I know Disney at one point wanted to, to copyright Day of the Dead, you know, the, uh, some aspects of it, you know, and, and the, the community was just outraged by it. So anyway, they were going to make a, a, a movie about this, and I think the, the producers, you know, uh, uh, understood that it was, uh, uh, understood and, and, and loved the, the cultural practice, you know, Dia, Dia de los Muertos and, and what it means and how we remember our ancestors and, and really appreciated that and they were they brought on uh, young uh, Latino uh, co you know mm -hmm. to, to help them with the work uh, great artistic talent they put together um, a group of consultants uh, Latinos uh, and so those Latinos are the ones that's, that said reach out to the broader community you know and so mm -hmm. uh, I was asked to you know go up to Pixar and with a group of other people you know they showed us the first uh, renderings and and what they were thinking and so we were able to advise you know and say well you know that's not the way really you want to depict that you know or, or why aren't you showing the indigenous roots of this practice you know mm -hmm. uh, and so that that kind of you know and, and talking about the music or whatever kind of feedback that we were uh, we were providing to them and it wasn't just me it was people from across the country and so they were showing us um, uh, as as the project developed you know they were allowing us to see it and, and comment on it you know so mm -hmm. at um, yeah so I mean we were called community advisors that's the way they listed us in the credits at the end of the of the movie. And it's, you know, and I was just, I was happy to do it because I just, I felt that I wanted my grandchildren, my two granddaughters and my grandson, to be able to see something positive for young people, you know, not just for my children, but for young people in the community to see a positive depiction of, 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 of how, of who we are and, and how we honor uh, those that have come before us. And this is sort of separate from Coco. Do you consider yourself an activist today? I do. An organizer, an activist, yes I do. And I can, you know, I mean, we have to be able to, to continue to do that work, you know. I'd like to say that at NALAC, you know, we, we organize very deeply. We are grassroots, you know. Uh, all over, all over the nation. But I have no problem, and we have no problem walking to the White House. We have no problem going to the Senate. Uh, we work at many levels um, with community, and we know that's what it takes. Well, that is it for the questions I prepared. Um, is there anything that you feel like we didn't address that you would like to talk about? Mm. I, I, I don't think so <laughs> right now. I'm not, I'm not thinking about <laughs> any aspect of that. I just, uh, when, when, when you were talking to me about uh, my appointment, you know, uh, it took a while, you know, to be uh, my appointment to the National Council and, and my dad was already very sick when I realized, mm -hmm. you know, when they told me, yes, it's just gonna be a few more weeks and you're gonna be, you know, you're, you, it's gonna be approved by the Senate. and. I wanted to tell my dad, but he was so sick, and he, you know, I couldn't tell him, and so I whispered something in his ear. I said, Dad, what would you think if I told you that the president was going to appoint me to the position? And he just said, <laughs> he thought I was crazy. He went like that to me, <laughs> and, but then he smiled at me, you know, and I, I couldn't say any more, and then by that time, my mom had Alzheimer's already, and she didn't understand either, uh, so I think that Just the idea that they would have been proud of me um, and that they didn't get to, to see that. And I remember that uh, before 
like a year before I even knew I was going to be appointed, I went to the White House and for a meeting, I was with uh, Americans for the Arts and we had a meeting at the White House to talk about, you know, arts advocacy and, um, and uh, we had, we had a, a, a representative from the Department of, of Agriculture. Uh, her name was uh, Judy. God, I'm, I'm, right now I'm forgetting her last name, I'm sorry. But anyway, she ran for office. Uh, she was from Uvalde, and she ran for office for this area, for, uh, for state representative, and, and uh, she spoke to us. I was so proud of her, you know, she was speaking to us there, um, and she was in the White House. And then afterwards, I went up to her, and we started talking, and, and and I told her I'm from Hondo, and she said, oh, you're from Hondo, you know, and I'm from Uvalde. And, and there was this man who helped me with my campaign when, uh, when I was running for, for office, uh, for representative. His name was T.A. Lopez. And I said, that's my dad. And I was just so proud because I never thought I would hear my dad's name in the White House. I would I never thought I would hear his name spoken there. And I was just so proud and, you know, it's just something I wanted to share. That is amazing. Thank you for sharing that. That's important. Thank you.